Hello everyone. I hope that all of you are doing good. Welcome to another lecture of robotics. So in today's lecture, we shall learn about configuration space. You can also consult the book Modern Robotics for more details. The chapter number is two. So in today's lecture, we shall first talk about uh, configuration space. What is a configuration space? And then we shall talk about the degrees of freedom of a rigid body and how can we calculate the degrees of freedom. And after that, we shall uh, learn about degrees of freedom of a robot and different methods to find the degrees of freedom of a robot. Then we have configuration space topology, how, uh, how a configuration space looks like. And also we shall talk about representation, how we, we can represent a configuration space. And then there, is a, there will be a discussion on configuration and velocity constraints. And finally, we shall talk about task space and workspace. So let's begin. So just a brief introduction again about the robot. So uh, this section is mainly concerned with the robotic manipulators. We shall also have some examples about the mobile robots or real mobile robots. But mainly uh, the intention is to discuss about robotic manipulators or the robotic arms. So a robotic arm consists of a set of bodies called links, which are connected by joints. So whenever we talk about a ro robotic arm or a robot, we say that it is, a, it is a collection of links that are connected by joints. And then there are actuators for example electric motors that provide force this is causing the robot link to move so see this is incorrect here it will be so i have corrected it um, the word was causing Actuators such as electric motors provide force causing the robot's links to move. So we have links, we have joints, and then we have some kind of actuators that provide force for the motion. And then with the robotic arm, we have an end effector, which can be a gripper or a hand that is attached to the link for grasping and manipulation. And finally, robots link can be modeled as rigid bodies. So this is how it looks like here. So a robotic manipulator, there is a there will be a base which is a ground usually and then we have a joint here and on this joint there is there will be a link and then there will be again a joint and with this joint there will be a second link here and here we will have some kind of uh, manipulate end effector that can be a gripper or any other two. So this is link number one and this is link number two we have. And this is joint number one and this is joint number two. And this is we have end effector. So we can model 
the links as rigid bodies we can see okay this is the link one this is this is the one rigid body and then this is the link two then sorry this is the link one and this is link two and they both are the rigid bodies they can be modeled as rigid bodies it means that the, the distance between any of these two points on these rigid bodies they don't change it means they cannot be they're not flexible they, they can't be twisted bent and they're rigid okay, let's go back to slides so yeah that's what we discussed here and now we shall learn about the configuration space so what is a configuration space a configuration space is a specification of all the positions or a specification of positions of all joints of the robot so what we have when we have a robot you have to you have to tell okay what is the what is the angle of joint one what is the angle of joint two and this specification is called robot configuration for example we have this angle here theta one and then you have this angle here which is theta two so if you want to say what is the configuration of this robot the configuration will tell the value of this theta 1 and theta 2 okay and for this uh, particular angles there there is a specific configuration for this robotic manipulator the n dimensional space containing all possible configurations of the robot is called configuration space so the, the space that contains all possible configurations or you can say in, in, in for the robotic arm or the, for the robotic manipulator, the all possible angles, the space that represent all possible angles will be called a configuration space. So yeah, so n dimensional n will be your number of uh, possible joints in this case so let's say if you have two joints so your configuration space will have uh, two dimensions having theta 1 and theta 2 uh, we shall in detail in the upcoming slide we shall learn in detail how we can do that okay next we have a description of configuration of a door can be done by single coordinate theta so let's begin with a very basic example about the how we can calculate the configuration so instead of seeing this complex robot let's begin with a simple example example of a door and so the door in your house so this is a door so here from here you can open it so how many motion it can have it can only open and close so it means it can rotate along uh, z axis so we have x y z axis here this is z-axis and this is x-axis this is y-axis so this robot can only rotate along z-axis and this angle will be can be represented by theta so it means that the this robot can be represented by a single coordinate theta and this will be its configuration so a point in the plane can be represented by two coordinates x and y so when we have when we look about a point in a plane so this is a plane a 2d plane plane is always a 2d so this is x-axis and we have y-axis 
and here we have a point here so its configuration can be uh, can be represented by x and y coordinates so this will be its configuration and this is enough for to represent its location in the plane okay you need only two coordinates and for the door only one um, angle is enough to tell the the location of this door so that's what if you remember that's what we here we have in the first line we, we studied here that it is a specification of the position okay so configuration you have to specify the position that where the joint or where the point is located in the space so for for a door for a door you can say that the it can be it, its position can be specified by an angle theta and for a point in the plane its position can be specified by two coordinates which are x and y so so this is the configuration uh, this is called configuration of any any body you can say any rigid body so the, the second thing that we studied is for the n-dimensional space so if you have all possible configurations of a rigid body or, or a robot and you this collection of all the possible configurations will be your configuration space for example in case of this door your configuration space will be all possible values of your theta of angle and in this case a point in a plane your configuration can uh, can be specified by two coordinates x and y and the configuration space will be um, a, a two-dimensional plane containing all possible values of your x and y okay so the configuration space also looks like a plane it will look like something like this containing all possible values of your this point so all, every possible uh, point okay so yeah and the third thing is a coin laying on table can be described by three coordinates x y and theta so let's see let's see we have a coin and it's laying on the table here and how we can now represent its configuration its position in the in the space how can we specify its position or location in the space so we can specify two coordinates like we did for the point x and y and then we have because this is not a point this is actually a, an object and so it must also have some kind of orientation also because it's a 2d so there must be some kind of orientation angle theta and here we specify okay we say that this is the front direction of the your coin this is the reference and from here we can specify the theta so this coin 
in 2D it can be represented by two coordinates and one angle theta so these are the this is its configuration so we can represent it like x y and theta and the space containing all these possible values of configuration it will be your configuration space okay now we have uh, we are familiar with the concept of configuration configuration space um, so now it's time to learn about degrees of freedom so what is the degrees of freedom the minimum number of real valued coordinates needed to represent the configuration is a number of degrees of freedom so real value is important here we need some uh, some real value number it should be some kind of continuous numbers okay and so that it means the coordinates should be real and also they sh they must have some uh, continuous values should be real numbers so yeah so we, we shall see also how the degrees of freedom are related to the configuration space the number of degrees of freedom of a robot is the smallest number of real value coordinates needed to represent its configuration so this is another way of defining the degrees of freedom a door has one degree of freedom a coin laying on table has three degrees of freedom let's go to here and again we check so this was a door first go to the door and we said that the door can be represented by the, the position of the robot can be represented by one coordinate which is what theta and this will also be its uh, degree of freedom because it can move only along one coordinate and for if you see a point a point um, in a plane it will have two degrees of freedom it can move along x-axis and y-axis okay and if you see a coin a coin will have three degrees of freedom because it can be represented by uh, three coordinates x y and theta yeah so here we can write I have one degree of freedom which is theta a coin laying on the table has three degrees of freedom which will be say x y and theta So yeah, so these are the degrees of freedom and now we shall see degrees of freedom of a rigid body and what, how we can calculate the degrees of freedom of, of a rigid body. Take an example again of a coin laying on the table. So let's draw a coin here. And attach a reference coordinate which is a 2d so this is the x coordinate and this is the y coordinate we have and we take a point on this coin and we call it point A Just make up make the coin a little bit bigger so it's easily visualized okay. 
Okay, so, so here we have point A. So notice that for this point A, how many degrees of freedom have this point A? So we have already studied that for a point on a, in a plane, we can describe it using two coordinates. So its configuration space will be 2 and also degrees of freedom will be 2 because this point is free you can put it anywhere in on this plane and similarly your coin will also move along along this point so now we have two degrees of freedom for a but once we have chosen the point a now let's take another point which is at a distance at a fixed distance from point a and we name this point as point B. And the distance between these two points is, we call it DAB. Okay. And yeah, so the thing is that once you have chosen point A, so point B can only be uh, placed at a distance DAB from point A because if you remember the definition of the rigid body, it says that um, for a rigid body, the distance between its points, they remain constant. Okay, so the distance between A and B is constant. It means that B can only be placed at this distance from the A. So exactly how we do that, we draw two circles here. One circle will be at center A and its radius will be DAB. So we draw this So this is a circle with radius DAB and so the B point is constrained on this on this circle okay because the B point can be or must be a distance DAB from point A so it means it can be either here or here or here anywhere on this circle but it cannot move away from from it Okay, because this is a rigid body and the distance between two points is fixed. So yeah, so this is, uh, this is a constraint. So now if you see that, what is the degree of freedom of point B? You can see that we can only, um, only describe the motion or the position of this point um, only in, on this circle. It means we can describe it by angle theta okay and yeah so it will have only one degree of freedom which is theta you remember the example of the door where it can only rotate and it had only uh, one degree of freedom so same is true for this point this point B can only have one degree of freedom and which is theta but point A had Two degrees of freedom which is x and y okay so now let's take another point on this coin and we call it point c let's say so here is point c and this point is present at a distance of DBC from point B and at 
the distance of the AC from point A. Okay, so again we draw circles here with a corresponding radius. And so from A point A, we draw a circle with radius of uh, DAC and the center of the circle is point A. So let's draw this one here. And the second circle we draw, it will be with a radius of uh, DBC and the point center of the circle will be point B. Okay, it doesn't look like circle, but imagine that it's a circle. So you see that where these two circles uh, cross each other. So this point is C and here also at this point also they cross each other. So notice that the distance of point C from B is fixed. Okay. So the distance of point, uh, this distance from uh, point uh, B to C, this is a fixed one, constant one, because of this is a rigid body and the distance cannot be changed. And same is true, the distance DAC is also constant. So it means that this point C has no choice moving uh, to any other location, okay? Because if you change its location, then this distance will change the AC or either DBC, which is not true it, because this is a rigid body. The coin is a rigid body. It means that this distance DBC and DAC should be constant. So if these two, both of these distance are constant, it means point C cannot move. It can only have either this location or it can have here this location at where these, again, these two green and uh, uh, purple circles they intersect with each other so if you consider this uh, this location here so it means that uh, coin has uh, one side on the top and if you consider point c here at this location it means the coin is inverted on the table okay the top is on the on the bottom side so yeah so if we consider here this point see it means uh, this point has no degrees of freedom okay it uh, it's just fixed it cannot move anywhere because we have already chosen the location of a and b and so this point has zero degrees of freedom and same is true for any other point you select. For example, let's imagine there is a one more point D. And if you see that because their distance from A and B will be fixed constant. So it means that their degrees of freedom will also be zero. So the total degrees of freedom is for this coin is the degrees of freedom of point A. So first let's see how we can calculate this distance. So distance of between point A and B is equal to uh, 
x a minus x b square plus y a minus y b square which is dab and this is constant okay and similarly we can calculate the distance of that distance between point B and C y b y c square and this is also constant because of the rigid body and then we have distance between point a and c x a minus x c square plus y of a minus y of c square and d ac this is also constant so these three distances are constant and if you want to hear calculate the total number of degrees of freedom then you have to use this formula the degrees of freedom is equal to we have sum of freedoms of points minus uh, number of independent constraints number of constraints so if you put here the uh, here if you put the sum of freedom of points if you can say how many freedoms we have here for point a we have two degrees of freedom okay so we put it here two plus and for point b So for point B, in a plane, it can have two degrees of freedom. So we write here two. And same is true for point C. In a plane, it can have maximum of two degrees of freedom. So we write here two plus two plus two. For here, it will be minus. And then we write number of constraints so point a it has no constraints okay so we write here zero and then we add here plus and point b it has one constraint so which is the dab because the distance is constant it's fixed so this is a constraint okay this one here this is for point B. So total uh, number of degrees of freedom were two and we have one constraint. So if we minus from here, we get only one. And then for point C, we have two constraints, which is D B C here. And the second constraint is the A C. So it has so we write here two here so if we add them six minus three is equal to it means it has this coin will have three degrees of freedom and these degrees of freedom can be represented as x 
y and theta. So x, y comes from the uh, degrees of freedom of point A. Theta comes from from the from the angle on this circle, angle made by point B on this circle, red circle. Okay and then point C offers no degree of freedom. So this is how you calculate the degrees of freedom of a rigid body. Uh, there is an also alternative method also. For example, you can calculate the degrees of freedom for individual points and then add them. For example, use this formula here uh, that we have used here. Okay, wait. So this formula we use for degrees of freedom. We use this formula and then we try to calculate the degrees of freedom of individual points. Let's say for point A, it has how many uh, degrees of freedom? Two. How many constraints it have? Zero. So we apply here sum of freedoms is two and number of constraint is zero. So point A has two degrees of freedom. Okay. And then for point B, we see that it has total degrees of freedom is uh, we have how many one one degree of freedom uh, no it, it will have normally in a plane it will have two degrees of freedom and then we have one constraint here so two minus one is one so this will have a one degree of freedom and for point c it will have two degrees of freedom and also it will have two constraints so they will be cancelled so it will have a zero degrees of freedom so this is how we can also calculate the degrees of freedom of individual points or you can calculate the degrees of freedom of the whole rigid body so and here one more thing i think i should mention the angle theta which is maybe confusing angle theta will be this angle here this angle here will be theta normally it's with the positive x-axis but just for to visualize it I think so you have some idea where the angle is so this will be theta and then you have x and y now let's move to the next slide and degrees of freedom of a rigid body but in this case we consider that our coin is not now not in the 2d plane instead it is in a 3d plane so previously we, we considered that the, the coin was on the table and we we took it as a 2d plane and but now we say that okay the point is located in a 3d space here And here is the x, y, and v coordinates. And here we have x coordinate, this is the y coordinate, and this is we have the z coordinate. So this is a coin, and we have point A here, point B and and here is point c
Okay, now if we, again, this is a rigid body, it means that distance between A and B, and B and C and A and C, they are constant. So point A can be, uh, point A has a coordinates, which can be represented by X A, Y A and Z A, and then for point for point B we have coordinates of X of B, Y of B, and Z of B, X of C, Y of C, and we have Z of C. So these are the coordinates of point A, B, and C. So if we apply the same procedure that we did for two-dimensional coin. So point A, if starting for, from point A, when we select point A, you can select it anywhere in this 3D reference frame. The point A, A can be here, can be here, can be here. So when you put your point A here, your whole coin will move here in, in this location. So Point A has a degree of freedom, it means 3 degree of freedom. It can move freely anywhere in this axis, okay? So if we want to write the degrees of freedom of point A, we write it as degree of freedom. Uh, number of, uh, we have number of, uh, number of, uh, Freedoms we have, which is for point A, we have um, it has three freedoms and constraints. For point A, we don't have any constraints, so we write it zero. So the total degrees of freedom for point A are three. So let's write it like this, point A degrees of freedom. So these are number of freedoms and th these are the constraints. And now we consider for point B. Point B has, once you select point A, then you have to select point B at a distance which is DAB. And this distance is constant, okay? Since this is a three-dimensional space so here this point b can be placed anywhere on a sphere like a ball surface having a center a okay if you remember for for the two-dimensional planar coin there was a circle okay so this red circle we can place our point b at any position or at the circle at a distance d a b okay uh, but when you look for a 3d so here this time we have we instead of having a circle we have a sphere sphere means it's like a ball or you can consider it as a balloon okay so i cannot draw it here because it's a 3d but it should look something like a sphere So um, so now the position of point B is fixed. It must be on this sphere, okay? And once it's on the sphere, you have one constraint here and the constraint is, which is DAB. So for point B, if you want to find out the degrees of freedom of point B, so total freedoms, how many freedoms it can have in a 3D? It can have three degrees of freedom, okay? And how many constraints this point have, which is only one point, one constraint, which is DAB. So three minus one is equal to, so for the point B can have two degrees of freedom, which is the one angle 
uh, one angle that shows its latitude and the second angle for longitude so let me for example how can you define the position of point on a sphere imagine the example of earth so we have a sphere let's say it's a it's our earth surface okay so how you define the 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 location of on on your earth surface like what you do with your gps so you have some latitude and longitude lines here and let's say this is your point here you want to define the position of point P you have to make you have to calculate its angle from the somewhere center of earth and you have to calculate actually two angles here so for the earth's coordinate we have latitude and longitude if you remember from the GPS so there are some lines that so there is one line that's passed from equator and then we have some latitude lines uh, from 0 to 90 degrees and also we have longitude lines that goes like so each line has specific angle and they go from uh, 1 0 to 180 180 and minus 180 so each line has a specific angle for example 0 and then we have uh, 30 degrees or okay let me change the color for example 0 30 degree Or minus 30 degrees something like this and for the longitudinal lines you can also have some values here for example 0 and then we have 80 degree and then we have 160 degree something so to, to define the location of a point on a sphere like earth we need two coordinate two angles so one is longitude and the second is latitude and same is true for your when you use GPS so it's also telling you your longitude and then your latitude so it means that we have for a sphere there are two degrees of freedom okay so yeah so we said that okay the point B can be at any point on this sphere and it's it can have uh, it can be represented by two angles latitude and longitude so and so thus it will have two degrees of freedom 
and it will have one constraint here. So yeah, similarly for point C, So point C, it will have how many constraints? Two constraints. One is the, we have DA, DBC, and second is DAC. Because the distance is fixed, it's, it's a rigid body, the distance is constant, so point B cannot move uh, in 2D, but it can have one motion along the third third axis. So let's see, let's calculate the degree of freedom of point C. So point C can have a total three degrees of freedom in a 3D space and it has two constraints. So the total number of degrees of freedom of point C is one. Okay, so yeah. So if you now sum up these degrees of freedom, three plus two. So this coin will have a total of total degrees of freedom of coin in 3D. So this will be is equal to 6. So it means that the coin can, can move any direction on any axis. Okay. So it can it can move along x axis, along z axis and x y axis. So these three degrees of freedom and plus it can rotate along y-axis, along x-axis, along z-axis. So these three rotations will sum up in a six degrees of freedom in total. So this is how we calculate the degrees of freedom of a digit body in a 2D, okay? And also we can calculate in a 3D. So a revolute joint calculate the degrees of freedom of a robot first we need to understand the degrees of freedom of joints so for a revolute joint it will have one degree degree of freedom in 2d it will have two constraints and in in a 3d it will have five constraints so a revolute joint So it will have so this is a joint how many in a 2d it will have how many degrees of freedom only one degree of freedom because it can only rotate with an angle theta So it cannot move in any X or Y directions, but it can only rotate. Okay, for prismatic joint, can only move in linear direction. So along any axis, let's say along X axis or either Y axis. So the movement along other axis, it's limited and 
also the rotation is also limited so it will have also one degree of freedom and in in uh, 2d it will have two constraints which is one angle and one axis one coordinate in 3d coordinate system it will have five constraints so all rotations will be constrained and two of the linear motion along y and z axis will be also constrained so only one degree of freedom here and similarly we have for helical joint uh, we have uh, one degree of freedom and it cannot in 2d it's not ap applicable here so we write here nil because this is actually a 3d system in 3d it will have five constraints and only one degrees of freedom so it can only which is only rotational so yeah so for if you want a figure i will refer to the chapter number two And the book name is Modern Robotics. And the figure name is 2.3. So here you can find the, 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 the figures of other joints because here it's for me it's difficult to make by hand. Um, yeah. So for similarly for other joints, for example, for cylindrical joints, it will have two degrees of freedom. It's also not applicable in two dimensional because this is a three dimensional joint. And in 3D, it will have four constraints. Similarly, we have a universal joint. It's only applicable for 3D systems. It will have a two degrees of freedom and four constraints. And same is true for spherical joint. Spherical joint have a maximum of three degrees of freedom. So this joint has a maximum number of degrees of freedom. And in a 3D, it will have three constraints. So you will see now how with this, as a robot is made up of joints and links. So uh, this is important to understand the degrees of freedom for each joint, and then you can combine them to make to calculate the degrees of freedom of the whole robot okay now we shall calculate the degrees of freedom of a robot and you can use this grubler's formula to calculate the degrees of freedom of a robot so this is actually Grubler's formula. So this formula is used to calculate the degrees of freedom of a robot. Okay, and this formula can be written as the degree of freedom of a robot is m into n minus 1 minus sum of all the constraints we have so this portion we have rigid body freedoms
and here we have joint constraints and if you see So what is M? So. Number of Freedoms of a rigid body. Uh, for for planar mechanisms or in in two dimensional space, we have m is equal to three. And for spatial mechanisms or in three dimensional mechanisms, we have m is equal to 6 for planar, and this is for spatial mechanisms. okay so here's the n n shows the number of links j is number of joints and finally we have C and C is number of constraints so this is how we can calculate the degrees of freedom of a robot if we know the number of freedoms of a rigid body whether it's a two-dimensional space or a three-dimensional space and then we know the number of links we have in a robot and then number of joints and then the constraints we can have so let's see by examples that how we can calculate the degrees of freedom of a robot um, first we need to define some concepts for example open chain and closed chain mechanisms so first we have open chain mechanisms or we can also call open chain mechanisms are also known as serial mechanisms So this is first type and then we have second type okay um, so this open chain mechanisms so 
So how can we distinguish them? So they are the mechanisms or the chains of links. Uh, they do not have a closed loop. For example, you can take an example as a a two two link mechanism. This is link number one, L1, and this is link number two here, and it has two joints. And there is no closed loops. You see, this is an open. Uh, that's why it's called open chain because it is fixed to the ground. And then there is a joint one here, and then there is a link one. And then we have a joint two, which is a revolute joint, and then we have a link two. And yeah, and here it's open. The link two end is open. It is not connected or fixed to any other thing or there is also no loop that comes back to the joint or the link one okay so that's why they are called open link mechanisms and then we have a second type of mechanisms we call them closed chain mechanism So what's the speciality of these mechanisms that they have? One or more closed loops. For example, Let's see an example of this mechanism. So here we have joint one, then we have link one, then we have joint two, link two, joint three, link three, joint four, and this here on the ground, you can say this is another link here, which is link 4 here so you see that these uh, it forms a closed loop starting from joint 1 link 1 and then link 2 link 3 and then finally link 4 connects the back to the where it started this link started at joint 1 and the link 4 connects it back so this is a loop so the loop is from where it started it comes back at the same location so that's why it's called closed chain uh, mechanism because they have loops closed loops so this is the difference between open chain and closed chain mechanisms so now we shall see an example that how can we calculate the degrees of freedom of these kinds of robots having these mechanisms okay let's start with example this in in the book chapter 2 this example is 2.3 so it says that we have a four bar linkage so this is a four bar linkage here
So we have to calculate the degrees of freedom of this four bar linkage mechanism. So how can we do that? We can use this Grubler's formula. If you remember from the previous slide, what we need here is M, N, and C here. Actually, we can also simplify it further. So this was a joint here. Uh, we can also further simplify this uh, formula. And this final form will be like this. Let's keep coming. Degrees of freedom of a robot is M N minus 1 minus J number of joints plus sum of sum of freedom all of all the joints so for i is equal to 1 f of i where f of i is the freedom provided by each joint and j is the number of joints starting from 1 to number of joints we add add all the freedom point, uh, provided by the joints and here we have total number of links minus 1 minus number of joints okay and m is the number of freedoms of our rigid body in in a space so that's how we can calculate the total degrees of freedom of a robot or a mechanism Here we define F We have defined C where F is the freedom of joints So we should use this formula here this uh, final form of this uh, Grubler's formula to calculate the degrees of freedom of this uh, four four bar closed mechanism so its degrees of freedom can be calculated using Grubler's formula it says that we have m n minus 1 minus j plus sum of all the joints freedoms okay here if you put here we how many links we have so first this is a two-dimensional uh, mechanism in 2d we learn that the value of m is equal to 3 okay so we put here 3 and then how many number of joints we have oh, sorry number of links this is the first one this is second third and we also consider this ground also and this will be our fourth link so number of links we have four minus one minus the number of joints this is the This is joint number, okay, same color again. I wanted a different color. So this is joint number one, two, three, and four. So we have four joints plus um, how many freedoms provided by 
each joint so since they are revolute joints so if you remember from previous slide that revolute joint in a two dimension it provides how many degrees of freedom provides only one one degree of freedom which is actually theta angle okay so we have how many joints we have four the degree of freedom provided by each joint is one so there will be total of four freedoms so now let's solve this one So solving this we get here um, 4 minus 4 0 then we have minus 1 and minus 3 plus 4 we have 1 oh, it's coming again and again So this means that this four bar linkage, this mechanism has one degree of freedom. Okay, and this is a closed loop mechanism. So, yeah. So now let's take an example of a slider crank mechanism. Um, we need to select pointer okay so a slider crank mechanism this is a ground and then we have a joint here and with this joint we have a link and there is second joint and with this second joint we have one more thing here And then we have a third link here. We can slide along this. Along along linear axis. Okay, so here we have a revolute joint and then here we again have a revolute joint here. And then we have a revolute joint here which can rotate and also we have a prismatic joint that can have a linear motion. So this one is a prismatic joint here. So this is this kind of mechanism. It's called slider crank mechanism. And this is an example of closed loop chain. or closed chain mechanism because you see there is a closed loop it started with a the ground then there's a link one link two link three and then this ground is also connected here so this is link four l1 
L2 and then we have L3 and here it's L4 and how many joints we have uh, theta 1 joint 1 theta 2 which is a revolute joint and then we have theta 3 here which is again a revolute joint and then we have here the X which is a prismatic joints so revolute joints we have they are 1 2 and 3 and prismatic joint we have 1 the total number of joints we have n is equal to 4 and number of links we have sorry not n So total number of joints J is equal to 4. Number of links there are also 4. Yeah, and this is a 2D planar mechanism. Two-dimensional or you can say planar. So Yeah, so how we can calculate the degrees of freedom? Of freedom using the Grouplers formula. So we remember degrees of freedom of a robot is equal to m n minus 1 minus j plus sum of i is equal to 1 to j f of i. So here in this case we have because it's a planar two-dimensional so here we have m is equal to 3 so putting the values here we have 3 number of joints number of links we have 4 minus 1 minus number of joints we have 4 plus the freedom provided by each joint the degree of freedom is 1 because the, <coughs> the degree of freedom of the uh, provided by revolute joint is 1 and also the prismatic joint provides a degree of freedom of 1 so if we add them we can say 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 so it will be minus 3 plus 4 and the total degree of freedom will be 1. So this mechanism will have a total degree of freedom of 1. Okay, so let's take one more example. Find degrees of freedom of an open chain mechanism using Grubler's formula okay so we have here an open chain and this is fixed
and then we have a so this is the first link and then we have second link third link and then we have fourth link and finally fifth link so this is a five link mechanism or you can say this is our robotic arm and this is link one here call it l1 l2 l3 l4 and link number five and this is joint joint one joint two joint three and joint four so we have four joints and five links available uh, since this is a planar two-dimensional robotic arm call it planar planar robotic arm so for this in the Grubler's formula which says that degree of freedom is equal to m into n minus 1 minus joints plus sum of joints freedom so here we have the value of m is for planar robot the value is 3 number of links we have 5 and then we have number of joints they all are revolute joints so each revolute joint has so we have four four of them we write down here four plus and here freedom of each joint so we have four revolute joints and each has a degree of freedom of one so we write down here one plus one plus one and one so five minus 5 so this term will become 0 and here it will be 4 so the total number of degrees of freedom will be 4 so you can say that for an open chain or a serial mechanism um, the number of degrees of freedom is equal to a number of joints Revolute joints, especially. Okay, so yeah, if you want more examples, then refer to chapter two of the book Modern Robotics, and there you will see more examples related to finding degrees of freedom of a robot.